Okay, welcome back to the Adam Hancock Podcast. This is our episode number three. So our topic today is, I think, a rather interesting, it's basically I want to get across a, uh, a certain amount of information, and I'm going to use this as fodder to do that in kind of an efficient way. Um, so what we're going to surround this topic is moving to Florida with a million dollars, as you can see in the subject of our video. But I'm going to do this in a, a little different way. And where last time we kind of rolled out a bunch of questions, we answered those questions. This one, there's a lot of commonalities and patterns of, of stuff I'm speaking to people about all the time. And a million dollars is a really good like over under price point to establish that. So I'm going to use that as fodder to do that. And we're just going to kind of kill, kill uh, 10 birds, one stone is the idea. So the first thing I want to talk about is where in a city. And the way I want to do this is basically if you called me and you were like, I have $650,000, I have $800,000, I have $1.1 million, regardless of that, what the idea is if you're trying to, kind of like on our last video, you're trying to establish of where, like why are you moving to an area in general? And, and the price point is very important because to, in my mind, it's the best version to move to that city. And now that, that could mean multiple different things based on your criteria that could mean that, you know, if you're at a lower price point, the best version might be one specific area. It might be well above any other area that's surrounding that. But at like 1.1 to 1.2 or a million dollars even, you have you do have some options because it might be stylistic. So like best version to someone might be in the suburbs for a single family at 2,900 square feet and for 950 grand get their pool and get their screen and their big backyard and it fits a family of three or four where someone else might take that same exact amount of money and say it's better to do um, a condo on the coast or a pared down solution to achieve the same thing now the important thing here is that it's not even right so like in most cities um, it uh, you can't take a million dollars just as an example, you can't take a million dollars and get the same type of house in two different areas. Um, so this would then it would differ on like uh, really really personal taste, you know, of like you might want something smaller and might want to drive ten minutes to the beach, but you might not, or you might think it's not worth the sacrifice of house, and you might try to find an, in, an intermediate option of twenty five minutes or something like that. So I think. Um, uh, price like so the million dollar price points a really interesting one because it does a lot of damage in the suburbs um, damage in a good way is what I mean but it does a lot of damage in the suburbs so you can get um, not I mean not the highest version of the suburbs but really close to like a, a well-priced version of what you should get for that money in the suburbs of most towns like this would be like a Lakewood Ranch to a downtown Sarasota or Venice or South Sarasota this would be a brand in Wesley Chapel, Carrollwood, to a Tampa, this would be a Fort Myers, and a, even like a Benito Springs or Stara or whatever, to a Naples and Captiva and Sanibel. So, um, but if you take that same million dollars, it does not do anything similar. So that's how, that's a huge drop off at that price point um, of like, you're talking like a decent sized condo, maybe uh, you're talking in some towns like you finding a single family within three or four miles of the beach near impossible for a million dollars. So that's one where it's like the, the haves and the have nots are a huge divide. So I think, um, I think in this scenario, I mean, that's something really to like, this one is like kind of intentional sacrifice. Like I've mentioned that in the past, but it's kind of, what do you deem important and, and does what you deem important align with your criteria in a realistic way? And once you establish that, then you're way better off because what you deem, you might be like, I love the beach, but you might find zero solutions that would fit your lifestyle and that would cause like you of reevaluating re or you might have money for both and, and you not want to pay the premium for what you deem not as important or vice versa. So that is where at in a city, um, that is topic number one. The second thing I want to talk about is this been this has been um, kind of the most uh, uh, relevant to recent conversations I've been having in this market is everybody kind of feels like you're overpaying in this kind of thing. This is the idea of staying in your lane. And I mean more staying in your lane from uh, um, the proposition of what you're trying to do, not like you as a person. So staying in your lane would be uh, surrounding the value proposition. And more, more than that, picking that same amount of money up and dropping it elsewhere. That's a great barometer of feeling like you, you, uh, you mitigated all the risk. Because the biggest fear is like, and what I'm doing mostly, it's the biggest fear is like, 
I'm playing a game of like, I don't want you to be mad at me in two years, basically. So everything surround what my advice, my fiduciary assistance, everything relates to that topic of like, could you really have done something better off? And if you could, do you understand exactly what you're doing? Um, and what I mean by that is basically like, if in a market where people view everything at a premium and, and you have lottery bids and you have all this kind of stuff going on, it still, it still hovers on the same value proposition. So like, for instance, if you had, if you spent $1.1 million or a million dollars to buy the Palazzo at Azario, and, and the way you get there is like a 503,000 base price without golf. Um, the lots on a lottery, so maybe you have to win it at a certain price over the minimum bid, and then you have structural upgrades. You have a pool. Just it, this is how you end up. You know, you were like, oh, it's 500k. I'll be at 800, no problem. But this is how people end up higher, is because it happens really quick. But that kind of buy is just think of okay. So say I was at a million dollars at 3,000 square feet, three bedrooms, two en suites, a half bath, a den, nice wide 62 foot lot that whole thing, right? Just think, okay, then take the same million dollars and try to replicate that anywhere else. There's not a lot of elegant options to do that. And that is one example of where I feel, I would feel, even if you could have got it at 900 a year ago, it's still the same scale of rise. So that's one where you're like, you're kind of bulletproof, right? You might be unhappy with the decision, but if you can't recreate the scenario, then one, it means you're probably not gonna be able to recreate it later. And there's probably a very little chance that that's ever gonna happen. You could do the same thing later, but also like, it, it stays in its lane for what it is. Because if you pick 2,900 square feet up and drop it at the beach, everyone would, or at least it would change everything, right? So that's a perfect example. Now, the other side of that is, say you're at 1.4 million. And this is happening a lot at Shoreview in, I mean, I talk about, this is mostly Sarasota related, but Shoreview and Lakewood Ranch at Waterside where it's Pulte, which is a mid-level builder in a lot of people's eyes, and, uh, but the water is unbelievable. And so people are ending up maybe at 1.4, 1.5, and it has a lot of intangibles to the area. So that's one that's you're like, okay, so uh, the same scenario, that million dollar one is, is ironclad though. I can't, there's there's a less than three, four options. I could totally think of you could do anything similar to that, maybe less than that. But this other scenario, you're saying like, okay, uh, I paid a premium with a builder that's not custom because it's laden with intangibles. Like there's not a community like Waterside. There's not bodies of water in suburban neighborhoods that are like these huge lakes, water taxis and this kind of thing. So you're like, okay, I feel good about that, right? I'm paying a premium for that kind of stuff. But at the same point, if you pick that money up, you can do other stuff with it, potentially. Not the same, but you can. So like if you pick up $1.45 million, you open yourself up to Lee Weathering in Tin at the Oaks and Osprey. Um, you open yourself up to other some, some custom options, really. Now, it's the different neighborhood and different stuff. So what, what's interesting to me is that the good thing about this kind of stuff, good and bad, right, is that, that those two scenarios are one where it's like, I can't think of one scenario where you'd be disappointed later on the first one. The second one, you, you kind of need to know more information to know. So then it's an intentional move. You could have done other stuff, but you chose this because you like the intangibles better. But you could have done other things with that money. So all that to say, I think that, uh, I think that, um, you have to have enough information to know, uh, to not have regrets later. And, uh, and the minute that, because what happens with this, uh, rambling a little bit here, but what happens with this is basically people don't just, a lot of people aren't just saying, oh, it's one, one, I have a million four, what should I do with it, right? Uh, it's a lot of people starting at one one or 900 and you end up there and that trickle of it, if you would have went in somewhere and you said, I have this amount of money, you would have looked at the whole thing holistically and you would have looked at it with clarity and you would have looked at all the kind of stuff currently based. But if you start here and you trickle to it, then a lot of times you don't reset and say, oh, well now I'm here, what are all the options here? So that to me is like, that's what I'm doing all the time is the minute it creeps to like over a line, I'm saying, well, let's step back and say like, okay, well, this is a different line. So before you do this, let me show you the other two options that now jumped into your sphere that weren't there before because of what I knew about you. And then again, it's the same thing. You buy it, then you're like, yeah, I get it. You might not like it at this price, but I'm buying it for these reasons. And then you have clarity, you got everything you need, solves the problem. So I'll leave that there. Okay. 
Two more. Third thing is finance versus cash. So this comes up a lot, comes up a lot with new construction uh, in this weird market where cash used to be king and it's not as king, not as much king anymore. I just want to talk real quick about this one. So let's talk new construction, finance versus cash first. So what people have to understand about new construction is that because if I, you know if I was buying something at a million and a half, just because it's so cheap to borrow money that um, unless you just want to, unless you just want peace of mind of it's paid off, then I think even at four, five, I mean, it's 3% now, but even at 4%, I'd still, I mean, borrowing that money, that leverage is amazing. You can always pay it off early, that kind of thing. So I think fi- even most people that I have that have um, high means are financing just because of why not? I mean, it gives you more flexibility. So, so people ask a lot with the new construction is like, should I show it as cash finance later for an advantage when I come to bidding or competitiveness? And what I'd say about that is, you have to understand that a lot of these builders make more money when you finance than they do when you use cash. And if like Taylor Morrison approves you for 20% um, 20% deposit and they approve you for their financing, then they're not viewing you as a risk anyway because they approved you themselves with their own financing company. They're going to make money from that. So arguably, they might actually view it stronger if you use financing. Not, I mean, not against a first-time home buyer, but you know, like if all is equal. So I would say it matters a lot less with new construction. So just if you, so I wouldn't just force cash if you want to finance. Really think about like it might not matter. So do what's right for you uh, financially. Resale completely different. So resale is it is very hard unless you get the right realtor and the right timing, and they're not going to play games, and you just get the right little timing. Like, like, for instance, like they went to a multiple bid scenario and no one bids. So they're on Monday. They're like, ah, oh, and they're calling all the people back that they told to pound sand earlier. There's a scenarios like that where you could loop in with some financing. With with the resale, what I would heavily advise is if you can show cash, so they think you're fully cash, the minute you close that thing, just finance it or finance it personally and pay cash. You want to show cash because what, what cash does is, one, it quickens the close time, right? That's part of it. You can close in two or three weeks. But two... Uh, it waives um, two other contingencies in a contract. So basically, in essence, when you're cash and you sign, when you submit that deposit within three days, there's a, there is a about a zero percent uh, way that you can leave a contract without giving your entire deposit. So it creates like when they sign, they feel like there's no, you're you're in. It, you just got to wait two weeks to close. So it waives the appraisal again, which is if it's overpriced in the current market, even if you like the deal. Uh, a, mor- a mortgage company is still going to want an appraisal and it waives the financing contingency, which is the first part, which those are two layers that you can exit a contract and it's not fun to exit, but you can fight if you lawyer up and you can get your deposit back. So that's why if I was selling a house, I'd be telling people only, I mean, if, if there was anyone with cash that was anywhere near you, I'd take cash all day long because there's no way to, for them to exit. So, but, uh, but new construction doesn't matter as much. So think about it like that if yeah. you can. And then, um, Finally, just to kind of wrap up some other things that have been kind of hot buttons for people is the same million dollar scenario. Uh, I talked a lot about like just like say 700 to 800, right around a million. The people that are like up to a million, but can't not like up to 1.3 million. So they can't, there's not a huge jump. And then the people that are like 1.2 to 1.4 um, is should I wait? Like all the stuff going on, should I wait? I did a whole video on that a while back, but like even more in real time, this is always a relevant question. I think that um, what I think people should do is I think you should you should solve the macro issue of what I discussed in the last video is pick where you want to be, narrow down like what you're trying to achieve like the whole area a little most people narrow a little radius, and then you should uh, you should work all of the things all of them you should do the you should do the lottery bid and work that system staying in your lane this is where staying in your lane would be especially relevant work staying in your lane on the lottery system follow it until it doesn't make sense work the resales at the neighboring neighborhoods and the existing neighborhood if it's old enough to have turnover um, you should be shopping just resales around it um, you could shop builders across different parts of town i think you you don't just wait to wait unless you're just kind of tired of the system fine but i think you need to educatedly wait educatedly i don't think that's a word but you need to you just need to wait with guidance because there's things that make sense until they don't and then there's things that could still be good deals for several months and you need to follow it. And I think you should just be not romantic about it. It's almost 100% of the time. It doesn't cost money to wait. But you should work these systems because the best thing to do, the worst thing to happen would be for you to say, this is too stressful. I'm just going to, I'm just tired of it. I'm going to take a break. We'll reevaluate in December. And then when you find out 
what what whatever they're going to do in December, you physically can't do in any point in time. There's no way to go back in time and do what you were trying to do. Or maybe you could have got it in September and you didn't know. So I think you need to just you just need to work the systems the whole entire time, even if you don't buy till next year. You need to know what's developing. It helps a lot from an education process. That's what I'd recommend. Um, and then you're just way, way more ready. And then you just never know. I mean, that's happened a lot with me is that people, um, a lot of people are, almost everyone that comes to me is like, oh, I can buy from now till end of next year. It doesn't matter, right? But what you need to know is the risk of if you make the wrong decision. And you can't mess that up if you're tracking the whole thing the whole time. So. I would say only wait if you have that level of information. Um, another thing that people ask a lot is how long will this last? Like this craziness. I think um, I think on that kind of a twofold. I think uh, one on the wait list lottery thing. Builders are uh, they're not enjoying what's happening now. Even like everybody thinks they're just making a trillion dollars. Uh, they're not necessarily loving this market either. They don't like lottery bids and stuff. I think the minute they can get rid of lottery, they're going to. I don't know if that necessarily gives you a quicker chance, you know, just working a wait list, but they're going to try to go back to normalcy as soon as they can. And uh, they're trying to keep everybody engaged so that when it's not as crazy as it is, whenever that happens, then they used to offer incentives and all this kind of stuff. So I think the best thing that could happen is um, for them to stop increasing the base prices of homes so that the lot the lots that come out in june you could still buy the same price in september that would be ideal but um you know you just don't know so i think that's where builders are that's where their heads are they're trying to i don't they they don't like it and they i think they will go back to normalcy could get more into regular wait lists at the end of the year but um on the other end of that i think how long it will last is based on I think the ripple is going to be real because the amount of people that this market created, the amount of them that haven't been able to solve the problem yet is way more than, than the people that have. So just this, the mere ripple behind the scenes of even if it's a normal market or back closer to normal, just the amount of people that this created this one time thing, reset the prices, everything, that's going to ripple for a long time. I think at least the end of next year um, is just if all these people aren't just going to call it a day, even if half of them said we're not going to buy anymore, it's still going to be more houses than I've ever sold. So I think people are still want to do it. So they're going to try to do it until they can. And if they're selling six lots a month and stuff like that, and there's no resales, and it's going to take a while to fulfill that amount of people. So I think it will ripple. So I think um, that's why I say it's important that I would work the systems. I think opportunity cost is going to be real because if it does ripple for the end of next year, the prices aren't going backwards. And then um, last thing, um, I've heard a lot of people say like, I'm gonna wait till the lotteries are done. And I get that, I'm empathetic to you just having like not feeling good about them doing lottery systems. The only thing I'd say there is I think, if I can be candid, I think it's short-sighted. Because uh, it's, I don't think anyone, uh, anyone would do it if it's, um, I mean it evens the playing field a little bit if you just jump in the market now, it gives you a real chance. But I would say, uh, not bidding because you're morally against lotteries or you think they're just trying to make a trillion dollars at the builder. Um, it, it Again, it might be something that uh, when it goes back to normalcy, that same proposition might cost you $150,000 more. So overbid, it's like overpaying for a resale. You could overbid for a lottery technically, win it, and be way underpriced than if you just waited for it to get back to normalcy. So I would say um, as much as you can, and I get it completely, right? It's it's not fun for anyone, but as much as you can, I would I would uh, separate yourself from how they are rolling things out, and what we're trying to do is accomplish the same thing: trying to buy a house, build a house, whatever. So, uh, how they decide to distribute opportunity is separate. So, when there's lotteries, I work lotteries. When there's wait lists, I work wait lists a different way. When there's resales that are opportunistic, I work them that way. Um, so I think you gotta, unfortunately, when, when you don't have leverage, you have to play their game. It doesn't mean it's a bad deal for you though. So I think, again, the more information you can know, the more that, that kind of stuff will sink in because um, in a lot of ways, lotteries are providing a lot more opportunity than wait lists are for people. And anyone that's engaged at Crestwind or Artistry or Neil in, 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 as of late will completely resonate with what I'm saying because that is ambiguous if anything is because waiting with no end in sight is not necessarily more fun than every single month getting a shot to bid on a house. Um, so 
that's kind of my nutshell. I hope that was helpful. Um, I hope you're enjoying these kind of podcasts. We're kind of doing deeper stuff along with other stuff. Um, so I hope you're enjoying the way we're distributing. Um, please reach out to me directly if you need anything at all. My contact information will be down here somewhere. We'll also layer some of the previous podcasts and some relevant information. Um, what else? Be look out for a new video on Sunday. And um, thank you guys for watching. We'll see you on the next one.